particularly like giving a talk sitting down. So I'm going to see how this works. Uh, my name is Joel Berger. Um, I'm very happy to see a bit of a crowd here. I know I'm up against Damien, but you know Damien doing Vim, so maybe people aren't so interested in that. And I see at least a few people here who I'm like, like, like Mickey. It's it's these are variables. Like my first slide is like this is a variable. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, thank you for coming out. Maybe you'll get something out of it. But this really is a beginner's talk. So if you would rather go see Damien or, or a, there's a talk on PDL, yeah? uh, I'm not trying to kick people out, but um, <laughs> this is a beginner's talk. So uh, you, know, you can have fun with it if you would like. Uh, to get started, I want to thank, of course, my employer, Server Central, for sending me here. Um, we do hosting from cloud to bare metal. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, you can come talk to me later or go to our website. I'm sure we'd be happy to talk to you. I always like to give a meta slide at the beginning of my talks because you know things on the internet last forever, but the content might not always. So uh, I first gave this talk about, what was that, six months ago? And I've just updated it for this um, conference here. You're welcome to follow along. The talk is on my GitHub at slash presentation namespaces. In fact, I'm actually running it off of this because it was just easier today. Uh, the source is located also on my GitHub. Disclaimer, this talk does not always use strict and warnings. Oh, gasp, ooh. <gasps> uh, part of the reason is because I'll be teaching you a little bit why you want to use strict. Um, but. We're, to get there, we have to start without them. And so be a little careful with some of these early bits of code, but I'll be happy to teach you why you want to do this. And as I said before, this is really intended for people who've used Perl, um, maybe even not that much, but certainly not dug too deep. And you've written libraries, maybe, but mostly scripts. You've one off you know, some DevOps and gotten some stuff done, which Perl is very good at. But you were never quite sure why to use things like our and local and some of the more, I shouldn't say esoteric, but different versions of uh, variable declarators. And I should even probably say, I was this person. Um, I self-taught myself Perl as part of doing my PhD research in physics. And so you just you see, oh, always use my. OK, great. So always use my. That's great. It does most of what you want. But then every now and again, they're like, well, use our. And you're like, well, what's our? What's, well, you know, you're declaring a variable. But that's my. We're going to get there. So this is a variable. We're going to talk about the variable kitten. We'll be talking about some kittens. I could have put in some slides about kittens, but, you know, you've seen kittens. And a variable is a place to put some stuff. So this kitten is called buttons. And as important as what the variable holds are some other things like, how do you find the variable? You know, its name, first of all, is an easy thing. Um, we'll talk about some things called packages and symbols here in a little bit. But they're, they're how, you, how you tell your code to talk to this variable. And also, importantly, what code can see it? What is the scope of this variable? And if you don't know what that word is, that's fine. We're going to get there, too. At one point, I was on Stack Overflow completely confused by this. And Tom Christensen, T. Christ of uh, you know, longtime Perl fame, gave me a great quote that I'm going to give you in two parts. And the first part is, packages are for finding things. So let's talk about collisions. So you're writing a script, and your script has a few functions. And at some point, you want to name something. And so you've got set person name, and name is Joel. That's me. And then later, you want to print the name. So print name with a new line, because we're not doing any kind of declarations. We, got, we don't have say yet. And somewhere else, you're going to set your kitten's name. Well, we're going to use name again because you know we're writing quickly and it doesn't matter. Well, if your program runs like set person name and then set kitten name and then print person name, suddenly my name is buttons and this is not what you mean.
So naively, what we might want to do is prefix all of our variables. Person underscore name or kitten underscore name. And this works. It separates out the confusion. Um, you know, you're never going to accidentally set person name to Joel, uh, to kitten, to buttons, and the other way around. But your variable names start getting kind of long. And this is where we can get to a concept of namespaces. And it doesn't look that much different. Rather than having person underscore name, we're just going to tweak it a little bit. And we're going to call it capital person. Actually, capital doesn't matter. That's just convention. And colon, colon, name. And we're going to do the same for kitten. And we're going to refer to them all the time by those names. It's the same as having underscores. The, you know, the name itself is disambiguated. So why is that better? Oh, before we get to why is that better? Turns out you can actually do the same thing for your functions. Why do I want to do set person name when I can do person set name and kitten set name? We've kind of the same way we had the underscores prefixes, now we've got namespace prefixes. So why is this better than just having underscore prefixes? Well, for the, the biggest reason being that Perl understands these. And because Perl understands these, we have shortcuts. So we can declare package person, and now under this package, everything is assumed to be in the package person, which is exactly the same as declaring them fully qualified, which is how you talk about with the double colons. So this is person colon colon set name and person colon colon name. And when we print them out, you get the same things. Uh, you see here at the end, I now explicitly bring us back to package main. And we do this because, just for consistency with the earlier examples, if you don't tell it which package you're in, the package you're in is main. So just to be consistent, I've brought us back explicitly to package main. These package variables are still global, and we can still refer to them by their fully qualified name other places in the script. It works just fine. So here I've declared person and a name of Joel and a kitten whose name is Buttons. But back in package main, we can still talk about person name and kitten name and get what you expect. Just a brief aside, this is how most of the internals of Perl name their things. There's a giant hash of all of the symbols. So person is a symbol, name is a symbol, and we make a hash of these. And the hash is called colon colon, just to be confusing, because why not? If you'd like to, and you can run these on your own, you can use data dumper, which is useful for dumping data structures. And we can dump the top level stash, so hash of all of the symbol table. And you'll see all of the symbols that Perl knows about. And it's going to be a lot. There's a lot of stuff you don't care about. So you can instead, because I've already loaded data dumper, I can just talk about data dumpers symbol table. And data dumper is actually kind of interesting because it uses some of these global variables to set how it behaves, things like its indentation levels and things like that. So that's an interesting example. Run those if you'd like uh, and see how um, the internal data structures were represented. This includes the functions in those packages too. So you'll see, you'll start to see how some of that internal stuff works if you look at those. I'm not going to talk about that too much, but just so you know that it's internally a big hash. So now that we can find things, there's the problem of maybe being too able to find things. And you might want to have some of your data be sort of private from the rest of your running process. So again, if I have person and person Joel and kitten buttons, perhaps my coworker Doug, Doug Bell of Preaction CPAN Testers fame, he might come and try to steal my kitten, the jerk. 
And so in some other part of the code, he comes and says, well, if I just set person colon colon name to Doug, suddenly he owns buttons. And you prove it by printing it out. Now, how can you prevent that from happening? Let's take an aside and do a more concrete example, because normally that's not what you're actually doing. In this example, we have a for loop over some items. Hi, hello, and hippo. If you like the British coupling, you know what that is. Um, we make a function called upper. It's a pretty stupid function because Perl already has UC, and in fact, that's how it's implemented. But you'll notice I'm for looping with my iterating item called item. And so we set item to first hi, and then we capitalize it, store it in upper, and we pr try to print item becomes upper. But down here, we also used item as our iterating, or as our uh, sort of incoming variable. And then we return it. And because these use the same variable accidentally, you know, these might be separated by many lines of code, suddenly you have capital high becomes high. Well, that's not at all what you wanted. You wanted the lowercase. And this is where we come to our good old friend, the lexical. So lexicals, and I'm only using lexicals on item because I didn't want to change very much. You could, of course, use it for at items and for uh, um, dollar upper. But we're just talking about it on my here, on uh, item. So by declaring my in this scope and my here, now these are two different variables and they do not talk to each other. In fact, they can't even be seen by each other. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But for here declares a block. We'll talk about blocks in a second. Upper declares a block. And so these my's are bound into those scopes and can only be seen there. And so now the code behaves as we expect. High becomes capital high, low, etc. So let's talk a little bit about lexicals. Lexicals prevent clobbering and overwriting of other variable content throughout the program. Whether that con overwriting would be intentional or accidental. So, you know, if you had some malicious code getting loaded in your library, it wouldn't be able to, you know, say steal your kitten. Or probably more likely, just accidentally, you don't want to reuse an iterating variable or something along those lines. It can't even read that code, let alone write it. Uh, but importantly, it's not bound to any namespace. All that stuff we just talked about with the symbol table hash, fully qualified names with colon colon, my doesn't talk about those at all. It has no concept of what that is. They're not in the stash in any sense. Rather than being in the stash, they're bound to a scope, as I said before. To go back to it, this is that original quote from, from Tom, completed out to say, packages are for finding things and scopes are for hiding things. And when you kind of internalize that, that mindset, you start to understand some of these. But we'll get to how that really works in a second here. Let's go back and prevent that kitten theft. So I have my package person and my name, but now you'll notice that I have name with a my. And now we've got a function name, which is person colon colon name function. And it returns the lexical my, a lexical name, which we declared with my. And the same for kitten. And now down here, when we do that same thing of printing out who owns buttons, there's nothing Doug could have done, no code he could write outside of these scopes that would allow him to put his name there. Well, there is, but not from variables, and we won't get there. It's Perl, of course. There's plenty of ways to do crazy things, but not accidentally. Is that making enough sense? Do people still follow along? So I didn't really tell you what a scope is. A scope is a block. We declare it with curly braces. And most of the places in Perl where you have a set of curly braces, that is actually a block. Um, 
declaring a function, uh, an if block, a while, a for, those are all blocks. Uh, there's one that isn't, isn't there? Isn't there one, it's like, a do, do block is a block. Feels like there's one that isn't, but for the most part, anytime you see a pair of curlies, even just an empty one, you can make empty braces. Oh, hash constructor, of course, is not, that's what I was trying to think of, uh, is not a block. Um, or the outer scope of a, of a block is the file that it's declared in. So this is slightly different than a package, right? Packages often are the start of a file, but you can still talk about that package even if you've got several different libraries loaded from different files. For a lexical, the file is the scope if you don't have it inside of another block. Which is especially handy when you're writing your libraries, right? You don't have to worry about cross-pollination of these variables. You know, it's just in that file. My microphone's moving. So. Now, interestingly, the package keyword itself is lexically scoped, so it cares where these braces are. Which means, if we go back to that same example that we had before, this package main uh, declaration here isn't actually necessary because we enter a brace, we say we're in package person, and then we actually fall about back out of the package at the end brace here. So for this one line here where nothing happens, we're back in package main. And the same thing happens at the end of the second brace. So we can remove that line if you want. It's not necessary. Person name owns kitten name. So should I use globals or lexicals? Should you use those fully qualified names um, which are accessible from other places or should you not? Well, you should default to lexicals. And this is why in most of the Perl learning and, and the same for me, when I came through, everyone just kind of says, oh, you should always use my. It's because mostly you should. There are a few um, rare cases where you really do want globals, but you're gonna know those when you get there. For the most part, you should always use lexicals. Uh, they're safer, as we've talked about already. They're actually faster. And actually, if you think, if you go back through the history of Perl, lexicals weren't added for the safety that we've just talked about here. They were added for the speed. Hash lookup is really slow, and if you're talking about maybe several levels of hash lookups, right, you're in package, colon, colon, some other package, colon, colon, each one of those is a hash lookup, and it takes a long time. The lexical is being bound to those scopes. The interpreter has that variable right at hand, right away. So they're much faster. You only want to use globals for truly global behavior. Um, sometimes system resources or um, functional behavior from non-object-oriented libraries have to do this because they have no better way. That's what I was talking about with data dumper, where you can use it to say, data dumper, please format my, my uh, dumped objects into certain indentation levels or certain um, um, pair joiners and things like that. If none of that makes any sense to you, you don't have to worry about it. But that's the few places you'll see these kind of globals. All right, well now, if lexicals are better than globals, why aren't we using those by default in Perl? Why, if I don't say my, do I get a global if I should be using a lexical? Well, they should be. But because Perl loves backwards compatibility, compatibility they can't be. So this is, we don't want to break old code. So we make you turn it on at the beginning of your code which I still personally disagree with, but it's the best we got for now. And that's part of what uStrict does. uStrict doesn't let you declare global accidentally. Um, much in the way, if you've got, you know, I don't know if any of you are in web development, JavaScript has that same exact problem. If you don't say var, you know, variable name, you get a global. And actually they implemented exactly the same fix. You have to tell it uStrict. <laughs> Um, actually, it's not all of strict. Strict vars is the one that gives you this behavior, but you want all of the strict behaviors, so just use strict. And now from this point, the rest of this talk is strict safe. 
I'm not going to write them because I only have so much space on the slides, but these would all run under strict. Now that I've enabled strict, how do you still talk about globals? Well, you can always use these fully qualified names. So kitten colon colon name will always talk about the global variable name inside the kitten namespace. Or you can use the our keyword. So if I declare package kitten, and then rather than my name, I say our name, what you've actually got is kitten colon colon name. And it's a little more complex than that. What you actually get is a lexical alias to the package variable. All right, now, that, now we're getting a little confusing. So if we say kitten's name is Buttons and owner's name is Joel, those are now safely stashed into or safely hidden inside of this braces as we talked about before. But maybe we want to have something accessible from the outside. Maybe we want to have the ability for a temporary caretaker to be assigned. And it'll default to me, the owner. And now we can print out info. Owner owns name, but is cared for by the caretaker. And if we don't set anything, it's Joel owns buttons, cared for by Joel. But from the outside, we can let Doug come in and take care of the kitten if he'd like. And you'll now see how that works. Does that make sense? Yes. All right, so this is a good question. So in this case, you know, this my, you're saying, like, can I talk to this my outside of there? The my, if you recall, only cares about these braces. It has nothing to do with the stash. It has nothing to do with the package. So if you tried to assign to name from out here, you would get an error because name hasn't been declared outside of here and strict prevents you from talking about name. If you didn't have strict on and you talked about dollar name here, you would be talking about main colon colon name and not uh, kitten colon colon name. And if you tried to do kitten colon colon name, that's a global variable which isn't talked about up here. You could set it, certainly, but nothing else talks to it. So you would set a variable that nothing ever looks at. Does that make sense? Right. Yes. Because that never looks at that variable, it, it's harmless. Yes. Yes, you can, you can push a little bit of data into it from someplace else and read it from someplace else. In some sense, it's just another variable to the Perl interpreter. It's kind of weird that you put it in someone else's namespace. But, uh, and, and again, this is the reason why it's more important to always talk about your variables that you care about, care about as my. Because now you've prevented anyone from doing that. Even if they do that, it doesn't hurt you. So that's a very good question. Now, back to what I was saying before about it's being a lexical alias. Now, let's say we start our package here outside of the scope with kitten. And I have to compensate for that by putting package main back down here so we exit the kitten namespace. We have the same my name and my owner. But we've now made a declaration of our caretaker here. And we assign caretaker the same way, defaults to me. This variable caretaker here, since it's still in the same lexical scope, still refers to package kitten. Now, this is a behavior you don't need to know ever. Like, if this confuses you, just never behave like this. But, <laughs> but, but it's good to note, to, to mention that this behavior is lexical. It has nothing to, to do with the package, just like my our declares the scope of the variable to be lexical, even though it refers to the package global. You're not going to get that the first time through. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> 
This caretaker is still kitten colon colon caretaker. This is kitten colon colon caretaker. And this is kitten colon colon caretaker. But once you would leave this scope, then that alias goes away. So if there were braces around this whole block, then outside of that, the caretaker alias would go away. This is maybe the hardest concept in this um, talk. And it really is OK if you don't understand it. Just know that that's possible. Halfway. Or maybe even a little past halfway already. It's OK. So an important thing about globals is that you be nice about them. Uh, often, if people have given you a global interface to your library, like Data Dumper does, for example, uh, you want to set the variable to what you need it to be while you're using it, but you can be polite and set it back when you're done. The only problem with that is being done is an interesting concept in a programming world, right? You can know it sometimes if you're in a small function or a small script. But are you going to remember to unset it? Do you have to store the value that it currently has and unset it later? Uh, it, it can be a little more of a task than you'd like it to be. So we have one more keyword here called local. And local lets you set a global variable, but only inside of your current scope. And interestingly, all of the scopes that that contains. So once again, with my kitten, my cute sliding. So we have, again, our caretaker defaults to me. And now Doug is only going to help me caretake of, kit of buttons inside of this block here. So local to this block, the caretaker will be Doug. And when we print out that information, we see Doug helping me out. But by the magic of this variable, you'll see, so if this was my, and if I set my caretaker as Doug, it wouldn't propagate into the function kitten info, right? So the lexical behavior would prevent the, the inside of this function from seeing it. Local is what's called dynamic scoping. You don't have to re remember that name if you don't want to either. But what it really kind of means is the globals will behave like you want them to in this scope, and then they will reset themselves when you're done. Kind of almost as if by magic. And Graham, yes, I know it's not by magic, so you don't have to tell. <laughs> um, but mostly by magic, you can just set the variable here use it as you would, call functions that refer to it, and when you're done with that scope, it will go away again. So again, here I am, again, the kitten's caretaker. An example of this is one of my favorite of Perl's magical globals, dollar double quote, which, if you don't know about, is fine. It's just kind of a fun little thing. Dollar double quote has this interesting behavior of if you put in a, you already know how uh, Perl behaves if you put a variable, you know, a single scalar variable into a double quoted string. You just get its value. Well, what if you wanted to interpolate an array into a double quoted string? You can do it, and here I'm just using add underscore, the, the function's arguments, and I'm putting it straight into a double quoted string with a thing I'm calling say these. Well, what is Perl going to do? By default, and you don't have to know this, by default, Perl joins them with a space. All right, well, that's interesting, but you know maybe that's not what I need. And in fact, I would like my items to be joined with a comma. So you can set dollar double quote equals comma. And when I say these, parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme, what I get is parsley, comma, sage, comma, rosemary, comma, and thyme. Now, maybe your script, so let's say this is some script you've written and you control most of the code. And you can say to yourself, boy, 
I really like this behavior. I want to use it everywhere. So you set it globally here. But now sometime later, you come up and you go, you know, I really like that behavior, but for this little bit of code, I really need it to be pipe separated instead of, instead of comma separated. Well, inside of a scope, you can set local dollar double quote equals pipe. Say these, the cows, sheep, and goats are separated by pipes. And then once you've fallen out of the scope, it immediately goes back to being comma separated again. Planes, trains, and automobiles. And this is really handy because you can get the behavior you want without screwing up people that are already have already written their code or other libraries that use their code differently, as long as you're careful and you use this local keyword. Does that make sense to everyone? Now, of course, local only works on these global variables, right? If I set my dollar $x and I try to say local dollar $x, you get an error because what you're really manipulating is this global stash of variables. But you'll notice I left this dot, dot, dot here, right? So that's not the whole story. Interestingly, and you don't need to remember this either if you don't want to, it also works on data structure elements, even if the data structure itself is lexical. So my data, data dollar $x is 12, local data $x is 50. What local really knows how to work on is data structures. So it works on the data structure of the Perl symbol table hash. You can also use it on your own hashes or your own arrays. I don't really recommend using this unless you really know what you're doing and why, but it can be really nice in the rare cases that you need it. Uh, maybe uh, the, the, the usual example I would give of this is in Mojalicious, you start an event loop and you want it to know for sure that the event loop is running because you have other code somewhere else that might check, is my event loop running? And so we actually lex locally poke in a variable into the object that is the IO loop that the loop is running. And we have a method that you can call that says, is it running? And it says, yes, I'm running. What that's checking is a localized <coughs> bit of data on the IO loop object. And that's because then we can know for absolutely sure that while you're in the loop, it's just a literal little while loop, you can know for sure that it's running. And then anything that prevents it from running, anything that'll fall out of that loop, the local goes away and it's no longer running. So exceptions, things like that, that might throw you out of that loop. But for the most part, you don't need to know that yet. Just know that it is possible. And look it up again later if you need to. And as I alluded to, you can also use local to manipulate the symbol table hash. Now, I didn't talk about this star, but just trust me when I say that's manipulating the symbol table hash. So you might imagine you have some database class uh, you know, some model layer in your web app. So my app database, and you've got a run query method. And later on, you're writing a test. And you don't want to connect out to the database because this is a unit test. So you shouldn't refer to your database in a unit test, in a pure unit test. So you might be able to set in your test script, and, you know, for now, just believe that star is going to replace this entry in the symbol table hash for the, for the uh, function there. My app database run query, which of course, my app database run query, as I said before, is the fully qualified name here. We're going to locally set this to return us some known result. We can then run our code. We know what the result that it got from the fake database query. And we can test that we got the code around the database query, you know, maybe you uh, check to see that the result you got from the database, you munge it in some way and maybe you make a string out of it instead of a hash ref or whatever you do to that result you got from the database. You can check that the result is right after all your other manipulations. But it doesn't affect other code around there. It's just in your test. You can, of course, also use it for some evil monkey patching, but uh, maybe you shouldn't. Something like you might set an, 
external function just for the scope of your function that wants to wrap it. There are better ways to do this, but you can do this if you want and if you want to be evil enough. If people see you doing this, they will be mad at you, so don't. Because, of course, with great power comes great responsibility. So in summary, as we said before, packages are for finding things. Include, you know, packages set global variables. We can control them with namespaces and package keyword. And we refer to them with the our constructor, which builds that lexical alias. Or I should have put, or the fully qualified name. Scopes are for hiding things. They have a lexical scope. They're bound to blocks. And we declare them with my. So at this point, I'll take some questions. Any questions that people have? No? I've confused you. Okay. Right. <laughs> sure. Nope, can't be done. I, I don't think it can be done. Can it, I mean, no, no sane way to do that. I can think of maybe some really, really insane ways, but they involve going down into the C layer, and you don't want to do that. Yes. So this is why I say even lexicals aren't totally safe. There are C-level ways to get into the Perl interpreter and say, all right, I see that you've got a scope here. Please tell me the things that you have in the scope. Yes, you can. Perl is very unsafe from a type safety standpoint. But other than truly evil hacking, like using Padwalker, lexicals are pretty well contained. I don't know. There are, there are two or three of them, aren't there, uh, Graham? It's, but I don't recommend you do that in the course of normal actions, no. I mean, the most I would do that is if there's some really horrible debugging that you need to get into, and for some reason you just literally can't put a print statement into it somewhere. But try to do it that way if you can. Anyone else? Do I have a couple more minutes, or? I, what's, what's my time? All right, I have just a couple more because I wasn't sure exactly how long this was going to go, and I wanted to get through those first. There is one more keyword for making variables, and it came in in Perl 5.10, and that's the state keyword. All right, so what's the state keyword? Well, it doesn't have any new behavior. All of the behavior that it has, you already know. So let's make a function with a counter. My count equals zero. And we're going to, every time we run the, the count, the say count, we're going to say how many times say count has run. Now, is that code going to actually work? No, this code doesn't work because every time you start it, you set count to zero. So every time it runs, it's going to say, well, we've run this one time. That's not what you want. All right, well, let's put the counter outside of the function. So this function has been called i times. And you know we're incrementing it here. So will this function work? Yeah. Except if someone else increments your variable and now, you know, it's it works, but it's unreliable. Okay, great. So now we wrap it in a block. So we've got a lexically scoped counter variable here, and only my function can see it. So does this now work? Yeah, but it's a lot to type. I don't want to have to type that every time. And I, you know, have my personal idiosyncrasies, like I like having my functions declared on the left side of the page, and now these are indented, and OCDs are fighting each other. 
And that's what the state keyword does. The state keyword builds an outer scope around your function that it declares your variable in. And it only runs the initializer the first time. So if you think of it as this, it is literally the same thing. And even the few weirdnesses that that might cause, they are literally the same thing. I won't tell you what those are. But this code is exactly that code. Does that make sense? So that one is new as of 5.10 or 5.10.1. I can't remember exactly which. You have to use feature state or you know use Perl 5.10 or something at the top of your script to get that because the name, you know, people were worried that the state name got you. Uh, that would be already used and they didn't want to break you. So you have to enable that feature. But it's in Perl since 5.10. Um, Mojolicious enables it by default for you if you're already using Mojo. Uh, I don't think any of the other ones declare it by default for you. Moo or Moose or things. Probably most of you are using 510, I hope. I mean, that's not really a change. It's just a declarator. It means you don't have to add the scope there for yourself. But it, it is just a my in the outer scope of the function. So I, I wouldn't call it a change. I guess as far as like Scoping utility, yeah, probably. I don't know. Does anyone else have a comment on that? I, I can't think of any other major scoping change. Uh, that is a good question. I think there is an oddity about declaring hashes. State hash is weird or something. I don't know. It'll warn you if there's a problem. There, there, the back of my mind, I seem to recall there being some odd thing. It, well, yeah, I mean, the, the keyword is supposed to trigger that in your mind of, of, of that's what it's behaving like. It will keep the value between calls. Right. That's, that's the important behavior is that the initializer here won't be called again. Now, if you set count... If your next line said, you know, if it was so state count equals one and the next line said count equals two, that will be run every time. It's only this initializer line that gets excluded on subsequent runs. So be sure you have that in your mind. That one line is the line that is considered to be in the in closing scope. And that's all I've got. So hopefully you've learned something and uh, yeah. Enjoy. Again, the slides are on my GitHub. I don't want you to memorize any of what you've seen as long as you know that you can go find it again later. <laughs>